Man, I'm constantly blown away just about what it means to be a part of a church like Hope and to be a part of stories like that. I hope you know, like, this is your church family. Like, that is a part of your story as well. Welcome to post-Labor Day weekend 2024. Like, we've almost made it through another North Carolina summer. Uh, if you're a college student, welcome back. I mean, you come back and then Labor Day weekend, everybody goes back home and now we're here together till like Thanksgiving. So welcome back. If you uh, recently sent a child off to kindergarten, you're probably just getting to the place where you're not crying every day. Uh, if you haven't, you'll get over it, I promise. And then if uh, you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, you're like us and you're still rejoicing in the Lord. They are back out of the house again. And uh, things are peaceful. And then for the rest of us, hey man, it's fall. We get some good weather, some football. It is on the screen. This has been a tough week for me for football. Uh, I'm the running backs coach at, at Garner Magnet High School. Uh, we got our tails whooped Friday night. And then uh, I made it till about halfway through the third quarter of the state game last night. And uh, that was not fun. So my only hope is maybe the Dolphins knock off uh, the Jaguars today. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, we should probably get started on a message, shouldn't we? Hey, listen, uh, we know every year uh, after Labor Day weekend, everybody's starting to get back in their family rhythms. A part of that is getting back to church. Wish that wasn't the case. That's the reality. We got summer vacations. But we always try to kick off with a big series. But I want you to know God has been working in my heart like overtime lately. And what I believe he's been calling me into and calling us into as a church is to focus on who we are as the people of God. Like in the craziness of everything's going on around us, like what are the fundamental basics about what it means to be the church in today's world? Because here's what I know. When you say the word church, it's so easy for your mind to go to a place like, like buildings, you know, especially when you have a campus like this, to go to worship services or how we've always done ministry. But the truth is God's heart for his church is so much bigger than that. And I'm deeply convicted that for us to be the people of God in today's world, we've really got to lean into what his original intent was for the church. And so as I stand here today, I want you to know our leadership here at Hope, we believe that God is calling us into a season of focusing on who we are. And as the church, as a family of God, and actually what it means to, to live that out in today's world. And so uh, we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks, this identity statement for us as Hope Community Church. We are a family. Like we are the family of God. We are a family of families who does what? Who loves God, follows Jesus, and shares hope. And over the next four weeks, we're going to begin to unpack what that looks like for us. And this week, we're going to be talking about why the church is actually the family of God and then what it looks like to live that out in the world around us. So I thought, hey, why would it be appropriate for me to start out just by showing a picture of my family. And so we've got some pictures here of a pretty good looking crew, except for one. So you can just scroll through the pictures. I'm not going to talk about each one. And what you'll see is kind of the family getting a little bit older uh, as we go. Yeah, just go ahead and scroll through those. So that's my... Beautiful wife, Diana. Uh, my youngest is Connor. He is now 13. And then our twins, Aiden and Addison, are 16. They're sophomores in high school. Here's what I want you to know. By God's grace and mercy, we have a great family. Not perfect. All right. It's very easy to get a still shot. I promise you in a couple of those pictures, I can still remember like the yelling and screaming that was going on right before somebody, you know, actually clicked a button. And so, but man, while not perfect, like we do have a strong family by God's grace. And a part of that is because there's certain things that we just do together as a family and we're consistent with them. Like we actually do spend time engaging God's word, probably not as much as we should, but we do. We spend time in prayer together um, just about every day, sometimes twice a day. We share meals together. Uh, we share meals with other families. We have people who we know are far from God that have different beliefs than we do over to our house just to share a meal, to show hospitality. We serve together, um, not often together at church because my family is like fully invested at the Garner campus. A lot of them serve in special needs ministry there and I'm usually moving all around. But man, there's certain things that we just do together as a family. Also, inside of our family, we actually have certain roles and responsibilities. So like if you went back to that first picture when they were young and even younger, um, some of our roles and responsibilities as parents were like changing diapers. I stand here before you today proud to say that like now at 16, we don't have to do that anymore. Like they've learned to take care of themselves. They, the part of their roles and responsibility is clean up after yourself after you go to the bathroom. Um, we used to have to cook for them all the time. Now they're learning things like how to cook. My daughter, is, she's 16. She is one of the best cooks in the house. 
I'm not going to give you exactly where she falls in the pecking order because my wife could hear this message and I don't want to create tension for myself later. My 13-year-old, he cuts the grass now so that I can do other things, so that I don't have to do that. So we all have roles and responsibilities. Having said that, there are still times where we don't have everything it takes within our family to make ends meet. Um, three kids all play in different sports. We got to get them here to there. You all, if you have kids, you've played the parent taxi game. And so we have to rely on neighbors. We have to rely on other people who are on the team. We have to rely on other people in the church. Uh, I've shared before, my dad has been, he's battled mental illness. He's in a really tough spot right now, battling depression. There's doctor's appointments, all kinds of stuff. And I had a woman come to me in our church after she had heard me share some things through a prayer time. And she said, you know, I would be more than willing to like drive your dad to some doctor's appointments and and help you out. I can maybe run to the grocery store every now and then if he's not feeling like going out. And I said, man, I don't, I don't want to be a burden. Like I'm not really good at asking for help. And she looked at me and she said, Jason, you deserve a church family too. And it was so meaningful to me, like just to know, like, wait a minute. So we, we really can rely on other people. And the good news is it's God's design for his church to live life as a family of families. And so my hope is that in our time together, we're going to see a very clear picture uh, as the church, the way that God designed as a family of families. And then when we leave, we're also going to have a desire uh, to live more rightly into that. And so this is really a two-part message uh, that we're all going to do in one part. And so that's really to, to get a clear picture of what God's intent and what his design was for the family, for the church. And then secondly, we're going to say, okay, like family could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What does it really look like to live that out in today's world? So our primary passage is going to be in Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to, turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. We'll see how much time we got. But just put your thumb in it, okay? We're gonna, we've got some work to do to get there. And so go ahead and turn to Acts, and I'm going to pick up in Genesis. To really understand God's design for the people of God, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning. So I'm going to just kind of highlight some verses. But as I do that, um, I want your mind to wander just for a little bit, not for a lot. Like I still want you to listen to what it is that I'm saying. But I want you to realize, like, we didn't just get here because of some cosmic bang. Um, we're not here on earth because like one cell kind of somehow magically morphed in a way that it never has before and, and, and hasn't since and then kind of turned into something as complex as humanity. Like we were created by God. And so I want to ask you, I want you to ask yourself this question, what was God's intent when he created us? And just think through that. So you got Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 26. And really during those first few verses, you're seeing God create everything that we know and experience really as humans. So the sun, the moon, the stars, the land, crops, things that grow, uh, fish that go in the sea, birds that go in the sky, everything was created. And along the way, he says it's very good. And then you get to Genesis. Let's see here. We get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the heavens and over livestock and over everything on earth and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So I want you to pay attention. He says, let us create God in our image. Like that's a plurality there. there that's, not a, um, that's not a singular voice. Let me. He says, let us. This is the first picture that we see of the Trinity in Scripture. And okay, what's the Trinity? Um, as followers of Jesus, we believe that the Bible shows a very clear picture that um, God fully exists as one God, but in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and really all we have time to unpack right now is you need to know that for eternity past, like even before creation and then even today and then for all of eternity, God will forever exist in those three persons. So you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who is eternity, has lived in, throughout all of eternity and will throughout all of eternity live in perfect unity, perfect community, perfect mutual submission, perfect trust, perfect peace with this perfect righteous character in a way that the Bible describes as this word shalom. 
Like perfect, holistic peace. And that God says, let us make man in our image. And so what that means for us is that we were actually made to live life with a sense of community, with a sense of belonging, like with that same peace, with that same shalom that he actually created us in that image together as a family. Then you get to verse 27. And it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. So God's blessing was a part of his creation for us to experience. And then God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So oversee all this that I've created. Have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we weren't just created to have this sense of belonging and community. We we're also created to have like a sense of purpose. Like go and multiply out this image that I've created and put inside of you and fill the earth with it. And I do want you to know like we are raising a generation right now that has less belonging and purpose than any other generation that we've ever experienced. But that was not God's design. And so what I want to do, I want you to see what the writer does just to kind of unpack this a little bit more uh, in Genesis chapter two, the natural tendency would be to think, okay, we've got chronological events in Genesis chapter one. So chapter two is just gonna keep going down the timeline. What the writer actually does in chapter two is he jumps back into chapter one, kind of right around that 127 that I just read, just after God had created man, but before he created female, and he kind of puts a microscope right on that area. So we kind of get to see, okay, what actually happened during that time. And so in verse 18, of chapter two, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And some of you who've been married for all of five minutes are like, don't have to be God to figure that out. And he goes on and he says, I will make a helper suitable for him. And so what I want you to see is not only did God create us like with a sense of community and belonging and purpose, like he also created us with different, like man alone by himself is not good. And not only is it not good for the sake of community, but like it's also not good for the sake of roles and responsibilities. And so like as, as, as created men and women, sons and daughters of God, we actually have complementary gifts. Like we are all needed to live this thing out together. And then he goes on to say after that in chapter 1, verse 31, Again, everything up until that point he described as good. But once this happens, it says, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. So when male and female are created in the sense of belonging and purpose and roles and responsibilities are created, he says it's very good. So now ask yourself that same question we talked about at the beginning. What was God's intention in creation? Because I would argue that the culmination of God's creation was man and woman Bearing the image of God together, living in community as a family, knowing that they belong, knowing that they have purpose, experiencing God's blessing with the command of being fruitful and multiplying. And again, that's not just about procreation. That's about like multiplying out this image that God has put into us and taking this blessing out into the world, multiplying that image of God into the world around us. I want you to see like you were created for a sense of belonging and purpose. You were created to be a part of the family of God, living life as a family of families. That was God's original design. And so <clears throat> things can get a little tricky here. You can say, okay, Jason, are you just talking about the nuclear family, like the husband and the wife and the 2.3 kids? And I would say for the most part, like if you have kids, you should round up. 2.3 is a bad number. You should go up to three, maybe stop at two. But but I would say for the most part, yes, it's not just that. I mean, we do believe, and I say this sensitively, um, we do believe as a church that it is God's design for the nuclear family. Like we, we see all throughout scripture, there's these household texts, that's what they've been referred to for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, where you see, husbands, you should love your wives this way. Wives, you should love your husbands this way. Parents, this is how you should parent your children. Children, this is how you should honor your parents. There's young people in here. Um, older men. This is your role and responsibility within the family of families that is the church. This is how you should honor older men, older women. This is how you should live. So the Bible is filled with these texts. And I would argue, if you look at statistics, the breakdown of the family design in society right now is one of the leading causes for society struggles. That's not a biblical argument. That's just if you look at data and statistics. <clears throat> 
And, and I say that, I, I want to say that sensitively again, because I know like there's all kinds of things, like we all have our own struggles. <clears throat> we all have times in our lives where it doesn't seem like, man, this wasn't how I was created to live. Having said that, that's not all that it means. I think we're going to see ultimately that the church is a family of families. And so whether you're young or old, married or single, rich or poor, a Wolfpack fan or a Tar Heel fan, or in this upcoming season, an elephant or a Democrat, like, sorry, an elephant or, what's the other one here? Thank you. So an elephant or a donkey, like we were all, which by the way, voting season's coming up. Somebody asked me if I was going to talk about politics. Uh, but you should vote. I would tell you, like as citizens, we have a responsibility as citizens of God's kingdom. Like we've been put in this land, you should vote. I'm not going to tell you how you should vote. You should do your research. I want you to, t- I want you to know the only one that's actually going to save us and set us into the direction that God has for us is Jesus. And so, but we do have a responsibility for, uh, to play into that. But <clears throat> listen, regardless of where you are on that spectrum, you were created to be part of the family of God. So now here's what I want to do. I want to take that identity that we were originally given at creation and I want to fast forward like thousands of years throughout scripture in like 90 seconds. So Adam and Eve were created to be a part of the family of God. <clears throat> they rebelled against God. Um, the moment that that happened, that created separation between God and man. That shalom that we talked about that existed between God and man and even between Adam and Eve, in a moment, all of that was broken. But you go throughout the entire Old Testament, God continues to pursue after man. God made a covenant with this guy named Abraham. And he said, look, I'm going to try this a different way. You're going to be blessed to be a blessing. So I want you to follow me in faith, take these steps. I'm going to bless you and your entire lineage is going to be blessed to be a blessing to the rest of the world. I preached a message on this a couple weeks ago. I would encourage you to go back really all about what does it mean to live a life of faith that we're called into. But then man continued to rebel. God continued to be faithful. Man continued to rebel. God continued to be faithful. And then ultimately it got to a point where God sent his son Jesus to earth to set all this that had been broken back uh, in place again. So it wasn't just Adam and Eve that rebelled. The Bible tells us that all have sinned, all have rebelled and fallen short of the glory of God. So every single one of us is a result of their fall. Like that seed goes from generation to generation to generation. You don't have to teach kids to argue. It's just in there. All right, and so uh, that, so it says all of sin falling short of the glory of God. The Bible also says that for the wages of sin is death. Like not just physical death, but a spiritual death, a separation from God. And so what happened when Jesus came to earth, he actually lived a life that none of us could have ever lived. And then he went to a cross to, to pay the death that we actually deserve to pay. He went into a tomb three days later, raising from the dead, overcoming sin and death so that we could have a re-established relationship with God the Father, so that our relationships with one another could be restored. And then the Gospel of John, chapter 112, look at this, it says, but to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters again, back with one another. So God created us to experience life as a part of his family. We rebelled, and then Jesus is the hero who made a way for all of that to be restored. And so I would say this to you. If you're here and you've made a decision to put your hope and your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like you are a part of the family of God. You are a part of a family of families that makes up the church, that makes up the family of God. And if you haven't, I just want you to know that I am praying that the Holy Spirit would just put this gentle conviction on your heart. And maybe not gentle. But that thing that you feel in your life where you realize, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking for this sense of belonging and purpose. I pray that you will come to know that you can find that in the person of Jesus. So <clears throat> we did all of that work to get to this. We, we become a part of the family of God the moment that we call on the name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So that's really the first part. Second part is what does it look like to live life as God's family? If your family is anything like mine growing up, you would argue that referring to the church as a family is probably a bad marketing strategy. Um, I grew up, my parents were divorced when I was one, and um, so just kind of life bouncing back and forth from household to household. Um, My mom married a good man, one of the best men that I think have ever walked 
uh, on this planet. A uh, lot of stability over there, but still going back and forth from mom to dad. My dad, man, he had all kinds of trauma and junk in his life growing up. And then he got remarried to another woman, uh, so my stepmom, and then she ended up having an affair with the pastor of our church. And so, I mean, you just think, like, that's tough uh, to get your mind around. That happened just before high school. But on my whole dad's side of the family, we're talking, like, substance abuse, jail time, murder, suicide. I mean, just not a pretty picture. And so if you come into this, like, family, my, I don't think family is, like, what, it doesn't feel like a good thing. I want you to know I get it. That's why we kind of got to step out of our personal experience a bit and go to the Word of God. And so what I want to do, this is where we're going to jump in at the book of Acts. And we're going to do that because this is the first church in Jerusalem. So these people had kind of just came to terms with the fact that, oh, wait a minute, Jesus rose from the grave. Many of them in the church there in Jerusalem actually saw the risen Jesus. Okay, and so this was a church that was just on fire, man. I mean, they were getting it right. I don't know if there's ever been a church that actually lived life this way since then. So we're going to jump in. Acts chapter 2, what does the family of God look like when everything's operating healthy? Chapter 2, verse 42, and it says, And they, so the church in Jerusalem, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship of the breaking of bread and the prayers. So it says they devoted themselves. Some translations actually say they constantly devoted themselves. Regardless of translation, like in the original language, it meant like on a regular and ongoing basis. We're not talking about like once or twice a month. Okay, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking, and probably if you re really dig into this, this means more than weekly, but what are they doing? Devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Do we do that? What does that mean? For them, that just meant constantly teaching and reminding themselves like, who was Jesus and how did he call us into living our lives? Recognizing him as Lord and Savior of our lives. What does it mean to follow Jesus as Lord? So they're regularly doing that. They're breaking bread. So they're constantly getting together, sharing life with one another. They're in each other's houses. They're praying together. It goes on to verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. Like there was a sense of awe and wonder as a result of how they were living their lives as families, as, as a result of like spending time in the apostles' teaching. And if you've been around Hope for any length of time at all over the last few years, I would say, man, I'm so, impressed is probably the wrong word, um, proud of the way that our church has grown, like just in their corporate worship and awe of God together. Um, if you've been here for that length of time, I want you to know that's not on accident. Like we, intend, we believe deeply that, man, if we're going to be the church that God's called us to be, we need to be in a place in awe and wonder of God. Because if we're not, we're going to be in awe and wonder of something. Sometimes that's fear, sometimes that's other things. So we intentionally do that. But then it goes on and it says, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And like there's theological camps that say like, well, God doesn't do those types of signs and wonders anymore. That only happened through the apostles in the early church. There's some people like, no, 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 I strongly disagree. And I, I don't care to like sit in a camp, but what I do want you to know is I do believe that God still performs miracles. And I just want you to ask yourself this question. Um, do we expect miracles from God if we just go through the motions as the family of God? And we got to ask ourselves that question, like, do we want to experience God's blessing in our lives if we're just going to go through the motions? And again, I should have said this at the beginning, as I go through this, like, I just, I want you to think through, is this my experience within the family of God? And am I contributing to the family of God in a way that I see this early church family contributing to the family of God? Then you get to verse, where were we? Let's see, 44. And all who believed were together, they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So they gave willingly, like to the point of going without. And let's just get in each other's business for a minute, uh, because why not? When, when's the last time that any of us sold anything for the sake of the family of God? My wife and I, we... Uh, I believe she has a full-time job. I have a full-time job by God's grace. I believe that we are very generous. 
um, as, it res- as it relates to giving to the ministry of Hope Community Church. We give um, far over 10% of what God has so graciously given to us. And I don't say that as like a boast. I say that to say like you'd think. I'd be like, okay, I'm fine. But when I really read this text, when I read the book of Acts, and I sit in this stuff, I think, man, I mean, we give generously by most accounts, but we're not, we're not going without much of anything. Um, my kids would disagree. I made them wait way too long in their minds before they got an iPhone and now they're 16 and they want a car and that whole thing. But like for the things that we really need, we're not going without. And so I'm challenged by this, man. Like are we really living this thing out the way God's called us to? So that's not a guilt question. These brothers and sisters, which they were, they were our brothers and sisters in, in God's family. They were so moved by what God had done for them through Jesus. They just couldn't help themselves. And that's what a family does. Like if you go back to that picture of my kids on the screen, my wife, like if, they, if anybody in that picture had a need and you really know me, if you think for a second that I would let them go without something that they need, you're out of your mind. But that's what a family does. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread. By the way, we don't ask you to come here every single day. We just want you to come here once a month. Um, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, look at this, and having favor with all the people. And when's the last time like we actually thought, you know what, the church has favor with the watching world. And you wonder like, is there some kind of limitation based on how we actually live our lives as followers of Jesus? But they had favor with all the people, so much favor, and it goes on to say, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And I wrote down in my journal this week when I was studying, I wrote down this question, and I don't want to get it wrong. What if a key to the world experiencing the gospel and believing the good news was the church actually living life like the family of God? Like all of us know, we turn on the news, we know things are broken, we see this whole big political divide and the election's coming up, and who's going to save, and who's going to do this. What if the answer wasn't a politician? What if the answer wasn't health care? What if the answer wasn't all these things? What if the answer to the key to the world, experiencing and believing in the gospel, was the church actually living life the way that God designed? I mean, if that's the case, we have a huge responsibility. That's, so, that's why it's so important right now for us to focus on our identity as the church. So... How does this apply to our lives? I think we ought to recognize that that God's design of a loving family community has really fallen prey to Western individualism. Uh, There's phrases like, you do you, YOLO, you only live once. Um, I told my daughter I was going to say that. She went, oh, dad, God, don't say that. Um, Let me me step out on some... some, uh, Maybe go out on a limb here. Um, My body, my choice. Um, I don't want to be so careful with that because I know that can lead to things. People make decisions. And so there's so much grace in that. And when I say this, and I know there's different situations and circumstances. But we got to recognize that things like that actually sound good on the surface. But I would not be fulfilling my role as a shepherd and a steward of God's word if I didn't tell you that. That's not God's original design for his people. And at the end of the day, um, all sense of community and all sense of belonging and purpose breaks down. Because at the end of the road of you do you, is just you all by yourself. I mean, if you walk down that road far enough and it's my personal preferences, my personal preferences, my personal preferences, my personal preferences, you can do that. But you're going to be all alone. And in a world that is like desperately crying out for unity, man, there's just, we're just missing something if we go down that road. Um, Coach Deron Donald, he's the head football coach at Garner Magnet High School. I mentioned this earlier, I'm the running backs coach there, so I work on his staff. One of the best leaders I've ever worked around in my life. One of the reasons why he's such a great leader is because he constantly preaches this value of family. He says, man, we are a family. We got to have each other's back. We're in this thing together. We're fighting for each other, not just on the field, but off the field. And he uses family as, I think it's called in an acronym. I was never good in English class with the one where you have a word for each letter. Let's just go with it. Um, He says, do you know what family means? He said, family means forget about me. I love you. 
And man, he preaches this over and over and over again. It's not about me. It's we over me. It's we over me. Our family is only going to be what it can be. That family that I showed you a picture of of my family, it's only going to be when I go into my family not seeking my own personal preferences, but I say, I'm going to die to myself for the sake of my bride. I'm going to be willing to sacrifice for the sake of my kids. And then it works a whole lot better uh, when my wife, and she does this better than I do, says, hey, I'm going to love you uh, over myself. When my kids aren't like fighting and wrestling and tearing at each other because one of them didn't do what the other one did. But hey, do you know what? Forget about me. I love you. And we don't get that right all the time. But when we do, man, you're like, is this what that shalom thing was all about in God's original design and creation? So Coach Donald put it to an acronym, but Jesus modeled it. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this than someone who would be willing to lay down his life for his friends. The bottom line is this, a strong biblical family, if you're talking about who we are, is when each member considers others' needs above themselves and then sees Jesus as the example. That's where belonging and purpose comes from. So here's what I want to do. As we wrap up, I, I want to give you three guidelines uh, for a healthy family. And I, anytime I preach, I feel a little bit weird giving you anything that sounds like, hey, these are three self-help tips. That's not what this is. I think these are things that are exposed throughout the text. But I, I want to make this simple for you. The first guideline is this. Remember God's design. Like God had a design and an intent when he created you. And it was to live life with a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. And so whether we're talking about your, your family relationship or whether we're talking about if you're single and like what does it mean to live life with your friends and inside of a family of families, like we've got to remember as a church what God's design was. It wasn't just to show up to a nice building on the weekends and sing some great songs and hear a moderately decent message. So that's the first. The second is we got to keep relationships first. So easy in life, man, to get busy, to do lists, to go here, go there, just talk about the schedule. Man, we got to talk inside of our own homes. Like, how was your day? What are you struggling with? Inside the church, I love that Doug said earlier, find somebody else's name, man. Learn somebody's name. Like, there's a watching world that needs to know that there's people that just care about people. That only happens when we put relationships first. And then the third is remain faithful to roles and responsibilities. Underneath your household, dads, our role and responsibility is to not to go home from work and sit in the recliner and sit there all night. We got a family to love. We got a family to serve. Wives, it's not just about like a to-do list and making sure everything is, is running smoothly. I, at least in my family, I know my wife is far more skilled <laughs> at making sure that things get done. But it's not just that. It's like how are we doing relationally? Um, inside the church, man, we've all got roles and responsibilities. We all have roles to play. God's heart is for his people to live life as a family of families. And, and I just want you to imagine what this could look like if we got this right. We would, we'd see strong intergenerational roots inside the church. We, we, we would have a powerful force in raising healthy children. Um, we'd be building strong marriages. We'd have singles that feel like they're connected to the larger church body as a whole. Um, what if we live like we believe this truth? Because this is true. Regardless of age, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, what if we live like we believe this truth, that actually we really are all brothers and sisters from the same parents, which is Adam and Eve? Like you look around this room, there's some diversity. We all come from the same place. Not to mention in Christ, we are brothers and sisters. We are one family. What if we actually live like we believe that? As we, as we move forward in this series, I want you to know my prayer is that we as Hope Community Church would live life like a family of families. A church that's passionate about worshiping together. A church that shares meals together in each other's homes. A church that intentionally looks around and says, hey, you know what? Forget about me. I love you. Um, we have this vision um, that we're praying through right now about what would life look like if Hope Community Church was, had like some 300 what we're calling missional communities all over the triangle, all over Apex, Holly Springs, 
Cary, Raleigh, Fuquay, Northwest Cary, Garner. And uh, a missional community is probably going to sound a bit like a small group, probably just a higher bar. But, man, they get together every single week and they, they share a meal together and they pray together through what's going on in their lives. They engage God's word together. And they've even said, you know what, we're going to be intentional about identifying a people group or some area somewhere in and around where we live. Maybe it's a school where we say we're going to go in and we're going to do everything that we can do to help them meet their needs and to serve them and to be on mission with the hope of sharing the gospel. And you might think, well, that sounds a lot like my small group. I know, we got some small groups that are really hitting it out of the park. We're not talking about dropping small groups or changing anything overnight. But we are talking about what does it look like to become intentional as a church about really living in to living life as a family of families. We were created to live life as a family that loves God, follows Jesus, and shares hope. All of that starts with loving God. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the men and the women and the students in this room. Uh, It is by no coincidence that each and every one that is in this room uh, is here this morning. And so I pray um, a prayer of blessing. I know many of us come from broken families. Many of us are in broken families right now. Many of us come from places that might seem a little bit different uh, than what maybe the Bible describes as the family as you intended. Lord, I pray for grace. I pray for mercy. I pray for sensitivity to your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that we as Hope Community Church would be a light in a dark world, Lord, that we would shine so brightly to a world that desperately needs it, that you would give us favor with the world, that you would add to our numbers daily, not for the sake of getting a bunch of people in a room, but because there are lost and broken and hurting people around us who desperately need Jesus. And God, I can't talk about family without recognizing I'm sure there's some that are hurting, there's some that have questions. Um, maybe even some doubt, and I would put myself in that camp right now. And so, Lord, I just pray for a special blessing. I pray for healing. I pray that you would give us confidence to remember things like you work together, all things for good for those who love you. Father, would you move? Would we follow? We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Love you guys.